Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's program from Duke Farms on what to do before you get your hands dirty in the garden. Um, my name is Kathy House. I'm the assistant at the community garden here in central New Jersey, a town called Hillsboro. Um, today's uh, program will be presented by Melissa Amendinger. I'm just going to take care of a few housekeeping items. Um, to get everybody started, um, you will not be able to put yourself on video or talk through the program. We've got um, quite a few folks registered, uh, so it'll be a big crowd. Um, you will be able to ask questions though. Feel free to put them into the chat or the Q&A um, portion of Zoom. And um, I can't promise that we'll get to all of the questions because we've got a large group, but we will do our best. Um, you can either enter the questions as Melissa's going through the presentation, or you can wait till the end. Um, I'll keep track of them as we go, and um, hopefully we can get through as many of them as possible. Um, you can also feel free to email us if you have any questions later on um, at communitygardencg at dukeforms.org. Um, any, anytime you have a question, just go ahead and send it on and um, we'll get back to you on that. Um, you will be getting a copy of this presentation later on. So uh, don't feel like you have to keep um, notes or all the notes as we go through the program. Um, so I think that's about it from me. I'm gonna turn it over to Melissa and um, she'll get charted. Hi everybody, welcome today to our program and thank you, Kathy. Um, I'd love to hear where some of you guys are from. We've been doing these webinar style classes instead of in person, obviously, but um, which I don't love because I like to meet gardeners and speak with them face to face. But um, we are able to welcome a much larger audience. We've had some people come from Canada, California. I've even had a participant come from Australia, which was so super fun. Um, as Kathy said, we're in central New Jersey, zone 6B. We won't be talking too much about like specific timing practices that happens during the growing season. Um, so that won't really matter. But once you get into your growing season, it's important to pay attention to where you're located, to know your frost dates so that um, you do everything at the right time. So I chose to do this program today because I find this time of year to be extremely relaxing. Um, you know, you can kind of wander around your yard slowly, take your time um, and think about where your garden is going to live. Maybe you're going to plant a new garden. Maybe you're going to expand something that you already have. Um, you can pay attention to where the sun shines, patterns of shading, keeping in mind, of course, the sun is much lower in the wintertime than it is in the summertime. Um, it's important to notice where water is pooling, especially if we have a snowstorm, you can see where it's melting, where it's pooling, um, and think about drainage in your yard and um, you know how that might affect your growth. Um, so there's not this pressure at this time of year to get things in the ground. You know, it's not warm outside, so we're, we shouldn't be digging yet or building anything yet. Um, and so you really have this long expanse of time. We have about two months until anything is really going to start happening in the garden. Um, and so you can do all this planning and thinking. So that's what our program today is gonna to be about all the things that you can do right now to sort of entertain yourself over the winter, get through this dark period of time. Um, and I know some people get frustrated, I do at this time of year, but really this is the garden, the time of dreaming. And this is when your garden is born um, you know, I am always adding new spots and places in my yard, and it's really fun to be able to do that with slow pace. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and start in on our PowerPoint. Um, today, you are going to have the opportunity, one opportunity to actually um, communicate with us on a shared screen. I'll show you um, that in just a few minutes um, when we are. <coughs> but... Um, you can basically, we're gonna go through this, as Kathy said, ask some questions, um, and then I will ask for your input a little bit later on. And then I do have a couple video components because I thought it's, it's always nice to see somebody in action in their, in their backyard, in their garden. So here we go. What to do before you get your hands dirty.
what is it that you can do at this time of year? These are sort of the things that we're gonna go through today. So you can of course decide what you'll grow. If you're an experienced grower, I encourage you each year to pick one new thing that you're going to try growing. This year, um, I'm gonna be growing um, artichoke. It's not new for me, but I've never been successful and I have some new ideas on how I'm gonna try it this year. So I'm gonna go forth with my um, artichoke growing experiment. I hope you guys are gonna pick something new that you are going to try out as well. You can start buying seeds. Um, for those of you that like to start your own seeds, uh, that's some, some of the most fun things that we do is to kind of look through the garden catalog and um, just, oh, sorry, just sort of dream about what we'll be planting. Um, a lot of times we get in over our head and start spending hundreds of dollars on seeds. So try to resist, use what you have on hand too, because um, you can use the same seeds year after year. Um, you can purchase tools and I'm going to show you some of my favorites and what I think you should be buying or adding to your stock of tools. Uh, you can go ahead and buy some amendments and fertilizers so that you have them on hand. Again, the day that you go and plant your garden, you may suddenly realize, oh my gosh, I need some compost or whatever it is. Um, so it's a good time of year to stock up on that before everybody starts buying things. Um, and then you can go ahead and plan your garden. You can do that on paper and you can do that using online tools. I'm gonna to demonstrate an online tool for you that I love um, and maybe you'll join me in trying that out. <laughs> okay, before um, we really dive in, I wanna talk a little bit about the difference between growing organically and non-organically. I hope that everyone out there listening to this program is growing organically. There's no reason not to. If you should not be afraid of it, um, there's only things to be gained from growing organically. I wanna talk to you about what, um, what the difference is between growing organically and non-organically. And, and most obvious is, without the use of chemical fertilizers, pesticides, or artificial agents. So if you grow organically, you can still use fertilizers and pesticides that are organic, and I will give you some examples. Um, however, there's plenty more to organic growing than just avoiding some of those chemical um, components. So you're going to be eating a lot more local, right? You're gonna reduce fossil fuels. You're, concern, you're showing concern for the environment by reducing pollution, reducing water runoff. A lot of times use, um, conventional agriculture uses chemicals that once they're on the ground, if there's too much, they're gonna run off and pollute local waterways. Um, your garden is really becoming part of an ecosystem. So it's part of the whole system of cycles of soil, cycles of water, animal cycles. So habitat, shelter, food, um, you're actually improving nature instead of doing nothing. So gardening conventionally, you may be just doing not improving or you may be actually hurting. It's important for me to point out to you that if you buy organic uh, produce at the grocery store, the only thing that that organic label confirms for you is that the farmer grew without the use of chemical fertilizers and pesticides. It does not guarantee that the farmer was taking good care of his land. It does not guarantee that he was being conscious of wildlife or water or soil resources. A good choice to buy organic in the supermarket. Keep in mind that that for the ecosystem as a whole is not always um, a good choice. And so the more that you can grow on your own, the better. And I'm so invigorated by the number of people that are interested in growing their own food these days. I think there was a resurgence last year during the pandemic just because food security became an issue that we really never thought of. Um, but I'm glad to see people continuing down this road and signing up for these classes and showing a vested interest in growing as much of their own food as possible. Um, the two labels here, the OMRI label and the USDA organic, USDA organic label are the two labels you're going to look for on any materials that you buy. So if you buy a bag of anything or a bottle of anything to put in your garden, um, that's the label that you're looking for that assures you that it's approved for organic growing. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to give you a few examples of, you know, the different parts of your garden that would be involved in these decisions of, of growing organically. So the soil. You can, of course, use the soil that's in the ground in your backyard. That's perfectly a great place to start your garden. Um, if you need to add a little additional soil or compost, uh, you're going to look for that organic label. You're not going to be using the miracle Grow or any of those artificial <coughs> um, soils with artificial and chemical 
fertilizers in there. And the way you can tell that is, first of all, it doesn't have the organic label. Second of all, it'll say on there, it includes slow release fertilizer. And those are chemical in, in a, they're made up of chemicals unless otherwise stated. Um, not tilling your soil is a great way to garden organically where you're gonna improve soil quality. And that's, um, you know, when we talk about tilling, we're talking about mechanical tilling where the mechanical tilling actually breaks apart soil, breaks down soil structure, you're gonna get um, erosion, you're gonna lose um, biological material like the beneficial bacteria and fungus in your ground. So if you wanna fertilize your backyard, you can purchase organic fertilizer. Again, you're gonna stay away from the miracle Grows. I'm not just picking on miracle Grow. there's probably plenty of other labels, but that's one that we all recognize as being a non-organic fertilizer. And I will give you examples of organic. <clears throat> Weed management. So instead of going and grabbing your bottle of Roundup or other herbicides, you are going to hand pull your weeds. Not tilling your soil is also a great way to reduce weeds. Every time you till or do too much digging or turning over a soil, you're actually bringing up weed seeds um, that would normally be smothered under the ground. So avoid messing with your soil too much. Um, you can also use mulch. So you can use leaves, dried grass, or dried straw laying down on the surface of your soil to actually smother and prevent weeds from germinating in the first place. And that's actually my number one tip. If you're new to getting into organic growing or you're, you've been doing it, but you're frustrated because weeds are an issue, hands off your soil, stop using, start using some mulches, and you will be happy that you, um, that you tried that. Pest and disease is just a, a feature of all gardens. Um, if it's your first year, you may luck out and not have any pest and disease, but if you start seeing things, do your best and please avoid chemical pesticides um, for anything because they really are, um, you know, that's where your poisons are coming in. I do not want anything that looks like, you know, like this seven dust on the food that I'm going to be serving to my children. So um, there are organic pest control, like chemical, not, they, they're not chemicals, they're natural, but that you can apply to help you um, prevent or control pests and disease. Um, you can rotate your crops. That means basically where your tomatoes are this year, put them somewhere different next year. So anything that's living in the soil, whether it's a, an insect that's overwintering or a soil disease, you put your plant in a new spot, it's gonna take a little bit longer for it to, it to succumb to that problem. Um, hand picking insects, some of them are easier to do than others. If you're a planter of potatoes and you're familiar with the potato beetle, um, especially the potato beetle larva, really easy guys to hand pick. They barely, they don't move. So they may take a while, but you can get just a little jar of soapy water, pick off whatever bugs you see, pop them in the soapy jar and they will, um, they will die. So that's um, a way that you can definitely, the, the most organic way to control some insects. Um, row cover, and I'll give you an example of what row cover looks like if you're not familiar, but basically it's like a white gauzy material that you can lay on top of your crops. Usually you do it right when you plant them. And that actually creates a barrier between the insects and the plant. So they actually can't get there. This works especially good for things like the cabbage moth that you may get some cabbage, you know, those little worms, the cabbage worms that land on your broccoli or your cabbage plants. If you use a row cover, especially earlier in the season, um, they won't ever, <coughs> they won't, excuse me, won't be able to land on your crops and therefore not, they won't be able to damage them. So let's think about if you're gonna be buying some seeds um, or thinking about what plants you're gonna grow, First, as I mentioned to you, you wanna know where you live in the country. Now, I apologize. I'm usually teaching this class in person, so we're only ever looking at New Jersey. So those of you that are in Canada and other places of the world, I encourage you to look up your own growing map. This is from the USDA, so it's only relevant to the United States. Um, but ha we have these growing zones and New Jersey um, is located in grow growing zone six slash seven. <clears throat> I live and garden in the center part of the state. So we're actually considered zone 6B. Once you determine what growing zone you're in, you have to determine what your frost dates are. So you have to know the last frost date of the winter. Ours here in New Jersey is approximately May 15th. That means up until that point, you're at risk of having a frost overnight. Any frost sensitive plants should not be planted out till after that. And then you wanna know your first frost date of the season. We're here in New Jersey. Again, it's about October 15th. 
And that means after that date, I wanna start taking um, in any crops that are sensitive to frost, such as tomatoes, eggplant, basil, because they are not gonna live if we have a frost at night. So please do go and research where in the world you live and where your frost dates are. <coughs> okay, um, you can grow so much here in New Jersey, again, in various parts of the country, you can probably grow more or your seasons are gonna be a little bit different, but these are some of my favorites to try out. Um, if you haven't tried some of these, I encourage you to add them to your list of veggies that you're gonna, new, new crops that you're gonna try out this year. So we have um, sweet potatoes and regular potatoes, um, broccoli, all of the cruciferous vegetables. So broccoli, cabbages, um, Chinese cabbages, radishes, kales. We can grow string beans. Celery is one that's really interesting to grow. There's a wide variety of winter squash. So pumpkins and butternut squash, and then all things like acorn, spaghetti, those all fall into the winter squash category. We have carrots and other root crops such as beets. Um, what else is on this list? Peppers. I didn't even put tomatoes because that's the first one everyone thinks here in New Jersey. We think tomato, basil, and eggplant. I'm not sure why, but that's why I didn't put it on my list. I figured you guys know that one. Um, lettuces. You can grow head lettuce. You can grow loose leaf lettuce. Um, I have here strawberries and asparagus. Um, I'd love to know if some of you are growing either strawberries or asparagus. Um, those actually are perennial crops. And um, so wherever you plant them, you are going to have forever in that spot, especially asparagus, because asparagus can grow for up to 30 years once it's established in one location. So if you're interested in getting your asparagus started and strawberry, think long and hard where you want that bed to go. Make sure it's not gonna be shading anything out. Asparagus at the peak of its growth can go can grow over eight feet tall. So make sure you're not putting that bed where it might shade out some of your other crops. But these are good crops to try out um, if you haven't already done so. <coughs> Sorry, okay. I'm gonna talk about my favorite things because again, here in New Jersey, everybody's always talking about tomatoes. So we have sweet potatoes and lettuce are my very favorite crops to grow here in New Jersey. They're easy. Uh, they are very resistant to insects and disease. I've never really had issues with them growing. Um, sweet potatoes grow from what's called a sweet potato slip and it's actually a long vine. And then the potato part is a tuber that grows underground. You can grow them in pots. You can grow them in grow bags. And um, they are so fun because whatever harvest you get, it actually will last all winter long. So if you end up growing like 40 or 50 pounds of sweet potatoes, you can have it all the way up until the, the following April um, when, you know, before they even go bad. So they're a good crop to kind of stock up on. <coughs> um, I apologize for my cough here. Garlic is another favorite of mine. However, garlic here in our zone six is planted actually in the fall. You actually still have kind of a small window. I've heard some people actually plant garlic in January. So if you think you want to try garlic and you have an already established, you have an established bed, you might think about popping some garlic cloves in there. You want to use organic garlic, um, not supermarket garlic. But if you don't have it, I, I encourage you to look into that next fall um, and think about adding that to your repertoire of garden crops. Okay, so the question is, where do I buy seeds or plants? So the, before we answer that question is the question, should I use transplants or seeds? Now, if you're a brand new beginner gardener and you've never put anything in the ground, I encourage you to utilize transplants sold at the garden center. Um, all the way on the left is the list of, trans, of crops that do better as transplants anyway. Um, so tomatoes on that list, pepper, cabbages, kales, and if you go to a good um, garden center, if you look up your local Agway, A-G-W-A-Y, um, they have them in most counties, um, you can find your local Agway and then go there early in the season, you know, in April or beginning of May and see what stock they have on transplants. If you're experienced in planting seeds or if you're a seasoned gardener and you wanna to try to plant some stuff directly from seed, or even if you're a brand new gardener and you wanna give it a try, I encourage you to get a packet or two of seeds and give it a whirl. This list in the center um, is stuff that you can actually do from transplants or direct seed. Um, and then the list on the right in the blue box is stuff that is way better off 
doing by direct seed. So for instance, if your garden center sells you a six pack of carrots, don't buy it because the carrots do not like to be transplanted. They won't grow very well for you and you're just kind of wasting your money. Um, this decision of transplants or direct seed relates to a couple questions. So number one, if you're starting anything from seed, you need to start it under, you know, in your house, near a lighted window or grow light, and you need to give it several weeks of growth. Like for instance, tomato seeds need to be planted, <coughs> excuse me, need to be planted about six weeks before um, they get planted outside in May. So really end of March, early April is when you're gonna start your tomato seeds. So if you have space, that's your first um, question. The second is um, varieties. Uh, you have a lot more variety options if you actually buy seeds than if you buy transplants. So if you go to the garden center, it may say paste tomato. But if you go in a seed catalog, you're gonna get you know, 13 different varieties of paste tomato that you could choose from. Um, the third is cost. It is way, way, way cheaper to buy seeds and start them on your own than to buy transplants because one pack of seeds for instance, a pack of you know, pepper seeds, you're gonna get maybe 50 pepper seeds and it's gonna cost you $2.50. Whereas a six pack of peppers at the garden center is gonna cost you maybe three or $4 for those six plants. So you just gotta weigh your pros and cons and see where you're at in your gardening career um, as far as if you wanna do transplants or seeds. <laughs> I already mentioned your local Agway store. They, they will have transplants and they often also have great sources of seeds. These are some of the companies that I've shopped with. And as Kathy said, we're going to send you this PowerPoint so you don't have to vigorously write down these names. There's many more seed companies, but these are just the top ones that I like to use that have a good variety of, or of organic vegetables, of heirloom varieties, um, and they're, they're really high quality companies. So I want to know... Um, you know, we want to talk about what varieties you can use to grow. So aside from, as I mentioned, if you want to grow tomatoes and you look in a, in a garden, uh, a seed catalog, excuse me, um, you're going to, tomatoes especially, there's probably 75 varieties of tomatoes you can choose from. It's a little bit overwhelming. You think, how do I choose um, some, you know, the varieties that are going to work for me? So I've kind of surveyed some people, I asked Kathy what her favorites are. These are some of my favorites and some of my gardeners have chimed in as well. <clears throat> I wanna to talk to you about just like sort of how we come up with this list. So for instance, beans, when you look in your seed catalog or even when you buy a transplant, you have to know if this is gonna be a bush bean or a pole bean because pole beans need to climb on a trellis or a pole and they can get over 10 feet tall. Whereas bush beans can grow short, maybe a foot or two. So that's gonna tell you which is better for your space. Um, let's see, peas, the same thing. You can have, most peas are vining types, whether they're um, sweet sugar snap peas, whether they're snow peas, you can get some bush types. So on here, I listed sugar and peas as a sweet sugar bush type pea. <coughs> cucumbers on here. Um, so there's pickling cucumbers and then there's slicing cucumbers. And then there's all kinds of different um, like Japanese varieties of, of cucumbers. The pickling kind are my favorite. I love them both for fresh eating and pickling because they're very, very crisp. So if you buy a pickling variety, you don't have to worry, like you can still cut that and put it in your salad. There's also greenhouse varieties of cucumbers. So if you're a seasoned gardener and you know you have a problem with cucumber beetles, you can buy a greenhouse variety and um, cover that up with row cover. And then you can exclude some of the pest damage. Lettuces, there's heading lettuces that you know, you're gonna grow romaine or a butterhead. And then there's some that you just sprinkle the seeds out on your soil. Um, and it's sort of a cut and come again. You're gonna sprinkle a bunch of different seeds down and then you just cut them and then they'll just kind of keep growing back for you. Um, something in our zone that's becoming an issue is the downy mildew on basil plants. It's actually causing a real problem in commercial for commercial basil growers. Um, there are some new varieties that are resistant to the mildew. So Rutgers Obsession and Rutgers has, I think one or two other varieties that are resistant to the mildew. <laughs> they do pretty well. Um, they're not 100% resistant, but um, if this is an issue for you, I would encourage you to try that out. If you've not seen mildew yet, go ahead and buy any of your regular standard basil varieties. It's important to rotate basil to new spots because that fungus, that mildew can live in the soil. 
Um, and I just want to point out some of our very favorite tomatoes. The list can go on and on and on. Um, Sun Gold is always everyone's favorite yellow cherry tomato. That's very, very sweet and delicious if you've not tried that one. Um, then there's some, <coughs> excuse me, slicers, um, you know, are the big slicers. You can get beefsteak um, slicing ones. So tomatoes come in all different sizes. So what I'd like to do is take a break from coughing. I'm going to have some, take a break from talking, I should say. I'm going to take a drink of water. I'm going to come out of sharing my screen and I'm going to allow you guys to tell us what some of your favorites are. So in the chat, I see there's lots of messages here in the chat. I'm gonna post a link right here in the chat. If you guys can click on that link that starts with the word Jamboard, it's gonna open up on your desktop when you open that link. Um, and then you can take the, um, you can give me a little sticky note, pull a sticky note onto that little chart and tell us what are some of your favorite varieties of vegetables. Um, and then I can save that list and learn from you guys. So I'm gonna share my screen again so that I can go and see. No, I don't wanna do that. Let's see. No, I can't find it. Of course. Well, hopefully you guys are clicking on that jam board and you're able to start. Oh, I see some, some coming in. I'm gonna get you over there in just one second. Here it is. Okay, so that way, if you can't happen to click on that link, um, you can watch some of these varieties coming in. Oh, black crim. I hear a lot of people talking about black crim cherry tomatoes. I've not tried those yet, so I'm excited about that one. Beefsteak tomatoes. I'm wondering if anybody has a specific variety of beefsteak that they love. I can't quite find a variety of beefsteak that I love a lot. You guys can tell me other things besides tomatoes. Don't worry about just sticking to tomatoes. Let's see, Celebrity and Golden Boy. Purple King beans. I've not heard of those. I mean, you have to try those. I love purple varieties of green beans, but keep in mind when you cook them, they lose some of their purple color and kind of turn brownish. Kathy, while we're in here, allowing people to share their tomato, their favorite varieties, are there any questions that you want me to go over? There are a bunch. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. One was very interesting. Um, should we be concerned about using these varieties in different zones, specifically concerned about crossing bio zones with new diseases? Um, that's a great question. I don't think so. I think some varieties of certain vegetables do better in certain zones. Like you'll read on there, like re some varieties are hardy to cold. So for instance, if you live in, um, Min you know, Minnesota, um, or Montana, where it gets really cold, um, you might want to do something that's a little bit more cold hardy. Things like onions, are very, very zone specific because the number of daylight hours affects how big the bulb gets. So pay attention to that. But for most things, I think you can kind of um, play around and you don't have to worry too much. You, if you're buying seeds though, just check the seed catalog and see what it says. Um, you want another question? <clears throat> sure. Uh, what is the definition or the meaning of heirloom for heirloom seed? That's a great question. So heirloom just means it's a really old variety. Um, it first starts out as being an open pollinated variety. Open pollinated means that if two, um, you know, if it pollinates itself or it pollinates another, um, another plant, it's going to produce the same fruit. So um, if you get an open pollinated tomato plant or pepper plant that, and you save the seeds from it, it's gonna grow into the same exact plant. The hybrid plants, which is the opposite of open pollinated, um, do not do that. You can save seed, but it might grow into a totally different type of tomato. Um, so an heirloom is just a really old variety of an open pollinated seed. And there's some companies such as Seed Savers Exchange that really focus in on those heirloom varieties so that they're not lost um, over time. All right, you guys can continue popping in some of your favorite varieties. I'm gonna be able to see this screen later and I can actually share it with everybody. So thanks for taking the time to do that. I'm gonna head back over to my PowerPoint. Let's 
see if I can get back in there. Um, where are we? Okay. Okay, so let's go on to here. Oh, I should have stayed out of there. So we're gonna talk a little bit about pools and this is a little video that I made for you of my backyard. So I apologize for this. I'm gonna go ahead and share again my video. And I'm not that great at this, so let's hope it works. Ah. Give me a moment. Uh, no matter how many times you practice, it never works out that way, right? Okay, here we go. Welcome to my backyard garden. Today we're talking about garden tools. Um, it's winter here, and so there's not too much going on in my garden, but I thought the best way to learn about garden tools, instead of just showing you pictures, I could actually show you some of my favorite tools and why they work and why I recommend them to you. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about is garden gloves. Um, you need to have several pairs of these because they will rip and they will um, get lost throughout the season. But I love these nitrile dipped. That means they have kind of like this plastic coating on the palms and fingers. And I love that because it just adds a little bit of sturdiness to the gloves um, so you don't get holes quite as quick. But of course I wear through several pairs of these a season. So pick yourself up a couple pairs. They don't have to be particularly expensive, um, but definitely garden gloves. Okay, we're gonna talk about some long handled tools. So there's two kinds of garden tools, long handled tools and short handled. So a long handle obviously has a long handle. Um, this is just a regular garden shovel. This is not really that important unless you're doing some heavy digging. Um, for instance, if you're building your garden beds or moving a lot of soil, um, this is a nice tool because um, you can kind of really get a lot of leverage, get it in your soil, press down in it and get in there and lift up a bunch of soil. It's great for breaking up compaction um, and moving stuff. Um, in addition to the shovel, or maybe as an alternative, there is a pitchfork. Pitchfork is my favorite garden tool to use of, of the long handle tools because I love that it has these spokes instead of just the regular shovel. It's not really good for moving a lot of soil, but it's really good for getting into new garden spaces, um, breaking up compaction. So you just, again, you're gonna step on it, you're gonna go down. If you can get down about a foot into your garden soil, just kind of lean back, pull up, break up some of that compaction, you're gonna get much better garden growth. And I usually go through my garden, um, either in the fall or the spring, and just do that kind of wiggling around. No, I don't turn over anything, um, just kind of break everything up. This is also really handy for uh, turning compost or moving you know, compost from one pile to the other. So that's a pitchfork. And then this tool I actually just started using a couple years ago and it's totally awesome. Um, it's called a stirrup hoe and you can see why because it has this little stirrup shape. Um, and what it is, is a weeding tool. So it's nice and sharp on the tip here. You're just gonna take it down right into your garden bed and kind of run it back and forth. And the sharp edge will actually slice the roots or the weeds right at the root, right at the soil level. Um, and you can kind of get right in between crops down different rows. You can clear whole beds if you're going to get ready to plant. Just kind of breaks up that crusty surface. Um, so this is an excellent tool to have at hand. It's great for pathways. I use it in my pathway. I just kind of go around and break up, um, cut, cut the weeds, and then I just leave them there to dry because I'm not that worried about them sitting there, um, but at least they're not growing anymore. Um, some shorter tools. So these are the two that I sort of most often use. Um, and this is called a three prong cultivator. So you can see that there. And this is just a regular garden trowel. So these kind of both come in all different shapes and sizes, widths, um, heaviness, material. You want to get yourself something that's nice um, and metal. Plastic ones oftentimes will break. Um, and make sure they're like a nice connection between the handle and the blade. Um, so they don't pop off during the season. A cultivator, again, is good for just breaking up soil surface. I love it just to kind of spread out um, my soil, my mulch. Sometimes I'll drag a line um, where I want to plant, you know, a row of seeds. I'll drag it and then I can see a straight line. A trowel is just a little garden shovel. So use it to plant transplants, dig up, pop out weeds, um, and do all sorts of other little digging. So these two um, are really must-haves. These are shorter handle, obviously, so they're for more intimate garden work, but um, I find that I use these a lot more than the bigger tools 
because once things are growing and all in place, you really want to get up close with your plants. A couple other tools that um, you might want to have that are kind of helpful. Um, these are little garden snippers. So they're just like little scissors, kind of pretty sharp, but they're great for like cutting kale or leaves of lettuce um, and harvesting things like that. Cutting off when I do my pruning of tomato plants, I'll use these to kind of go through and clip. So these are a nice tool. You could also just have a pair of scissors um, that would work as well, as long as they were sharp. This is a moisture meter. Um, and this guy, let me see if I can get up close to the camera. Um, it's gonna say dry, moist, or wet. Um, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna pop it right down into the soil a couple inches down, and you can read your moisture reading. So my ground's kind of cold and wet right now. Um, it's saying dry, um, probably in another spot it's gonna say moist or wet because depending on where the ice is, yep, the ice is melting. But this is a great tool because um, in the summer when you're not sure if you should water, a lot of people will look at the surface, see that dried up soil and think they immediately need to water and they water like the top one inch. That's really an inefficient way of watering. It's actually um, harmful to your plants because what you're doing is concentrating all that water at the surface, all the roots then stay at the surface. What you wanna do is encourage them to grow deep. So you get this moisture meter, you're gonna measure about three inches deep, see how moist it is. If it says moist, uh, you're gonna leave it alone. You do not have to water that day. Once or twice a week is really fine for watering. A lot of gardeners think they need to be there every single day, uh, not necessary. What else do I have? Um, I always have on hand just the buckets. I have lots of buckets. My family always gets mad because I kind of leave them all over the place half filled up with weeds, but I'm always carrying these around, throw some weed. I like this better than a wheelbarrow. Uh, my compost pile is pretty close. So if you have a wheelbarrow, maybe you don't need bucket, but I always think that those are really helpful. Um, this is a one and a half gallon pump sprayer. You might have seen these for use um, for herbicides. That's not what we're using them for here today. I just buy this. You can buy these empty at like your big box stores or online. Um, and you can use them for foliar feeding um, fertilizer of your plants. So I like to use this with a liquid seaweed, kelp, liquid fish emulsion. Um, I, I calculate how much goes in the one and a half gallons. I fill it up with water and then I can go around and easily spray the leaves of my plant. So I get a nice coverage, nice foliar treatment, very easy and a lot easier than using a watering can, which would be the other way to do that, um, where you have to keep going back and forth and getting that filled up. Um, I always have mulch on hand and I recommend you do the same. So these are just some bags of leaves. I collect them in the fall. I leave them all you know, in bags or I put them in the compost. Like I have like 15 bags of leaves emptied in one of my compost piles and um, use them as mulch. So I have these leaves. When they run out, I'll probably get a bale of straw. I already have leaves um, around my garden. The goal would be to not have your soil exposed. So anytime, you know, plant your stuff, if there's soil, um, obviously if you're trying to germinate carrots or something, you want to leave the soil exposed so that they can germinate. But any other time, pack the mulch in around the plants. It's going to do three things for you. It's going to keep the weeds down. It's going to keep the moisture into the soil. So you have to water a little bit less. And then it's also going to um, protect your plants from um, erosion and wind and things like that. Also add some, a little bit of organic matter to your soil. It's going to decompose over time. So that's a really good um, tip just to kind of have whatever mulch you can use. Leaves, straw, you can use dried grass if you do not have, you know, if you're not treating your lawn with chemicals. Um, and those, those are what I recommend. Farmers will use pla what we call plastic mulch, obviously just a, like a layer of plastic that prevents the weeds from growing. But in a backyard garden, I really don't, I don't love using plastic, period. Um, but it is on a smaller scale, you really can just use a regular organic mulch and then any weeds that pop through, um, you can go ahead and pull them. The last thing I'm gonna talk about are row covers. Um, row covers are excellent for keeping out insects and also kind of protecting crops from a little bit of cold or a little bit of heat. Um, so you can, I use like these little hoop cut hoops under here and then I stretch the row cover. You can buy this online at any place that sells, you know, garden supplies. 
You might be able to buy it at your local Agway or nursery, um, and you can buy them in different widths and different lengths. So just make sure when you're calculating the width, it's not the actual width of your garden bed, it's like the circle. So if your garden bed is like four feet wide, you probably need eight or 10 feet wide of row cover. Um, I use just rocks to weight them down at the end. Um, early in the season, pop these guys on. It'll help your germination rate because it holds a little bit of moisture in. It'll keep the insects and um, animals to some degree out. This is what a little, a little hoop. Um, I have these little tiny ones and then you can also um, use uh, get much larger hoops. You can also just forget about the hoops and lay it flat onto your um, plants, especially if it's just seeds that are germinating. So I hope you learned something today about garden tools. Maybe pick yourself up some of these tools over the winter so you're ready in the spring to start planting. So enjoy and I hope to see you in the garden. All right. If I go here, Kathy, can you see my PowerPoint? Yes, I okay. garden tools. Great, just wanted to check. All right, I just popped this in here because it's kind of a summary of what I just talked about. Um, that way you have it as a reference to some of those tools. Um, I told you I would give you some examples of my favorite amendments and fertilizers. So here we go. Um, starting on the left, it's if you have a, just a sort of a general purpose all around fertilizer, you can use the same thing for all of your plants. Um, and a lot of times, you know, if you're going to plant a transplant, you dig a little hole, you might put a tablespoon or two of fertilizer in the hole just to kind of make sure the roots get going. Again, you're going to look for that OMRI label or the USDA organic label. These are two of my favorite brands, Coast of Maine and the Espoma line of um, fertilizers and amendments. So these are two of my favorites. Uh, compost, if you don't have a backyard compost pile where you can kind of grab compost from, I recommend getting a bag or two to have on hand. Anytime you plant something, again, you can throw a little compost in, or if you're gonna plant a whole row, you can spread some compost over the surface and kind of work it in um, to that top inch of soil. You can use homemade if you have it, but again, if you don't have it, this is a good, um, a good uh, brand name to look out for. Um, all the way on the right, I already mentioned liquid fertilizers when I was talking about my sprayer. These are what they look like. You put about only a capful or two into that one and a half gallon sprayer. You, and sprayers come in all different sizes. You can get smaller ones as well. <clears throat> but that's what I was talking about when I was mentioning liquid fertilizers. They are, it's recommended to apply them to your plants just generally all over every like seven to 10 days, or maybe once every other week, you know, pick a day, every other Friday or something. And it really will increase the, the productivity of your plants. And it'll, it's like kind of like probiotics for plants, gives them that little boost. And then the last um, item is diatomaceous earth. That's more for insect control um, and slug control, but it's just a great tool to have on hand kind of in your back pocket. Diatomaceous earth, you wanna look for food grade, not the stuff that people use in swimming pools. Um, and you wanna also be careful that you don't breathe it in. I actually recommend wearing a mask when you use diatomaceous earth. And these days we all have plenty of masks sitting around um, just because it can be irritating to your lungs. <clears throat> but what you can do is sprinkle it on. You can use like a sifter or just kind of um, sprinkle it on with, you know, with your hand or a little cup and it will prevent insects and slugs from chewing on your plants. It doesn't hurt them. Um, it just, well, it might hurt them. That's not true, but it's not, it's not a general, you know, it's not like a chemical um, and, but it just prevents them from chewing on your leaves. So if you see any holes, this is a good one to try out and just see if that sort of stops some of the damage. All right, I'm gonna do another video clip and we're gonna talk about the placement and size of your garden. So let's see if we can get that going. Welcome back. This time we're talking about where your garden should be located in your backyard and how big your garden beds and your entire garden for that matter should be. So when you think about location, you want to think about a couple key factors. Number one is sun. The sun um, in our zone, I live in New Jersey in zone 6B. Um, we have a southern sun because the equator is south of us. So find the south facing uh, part of your yard. So for south for me is directly this way. So I have my garden set up over here. There's no trees on the southern side that are going to block it from any sunlight. Um, and that's really important. Your garden needs full sun 
um, at least six to eight hours of sun a day in the summer. More is always better. You wanna think about soil. You wanna pick a spot in your backyard where the soil is not gonna get soggy, um, is gonna drain pretty nicely. Sometimes that, you can work around that, you can put in some drainage, but obviously it's just easier if you start with a spot that um, um, is nicely drained. You wanna think about wind. I don't have a particular wind problem here in my backyard, but if you did, you might wanna think about putting up a wind block, maybe some evergreen trees. Um, of course, you don't want them to block the sun. You might be able to put up fencing that blocks some of the wind, but you do wanna think about that if you're on a really exposed area. Um, aside from the sun, the soil, and the wind, you wanna think about water access. So wherever your garden is located, you're going to have to water it sometimes. Hopefully not that often, it'll be nice and raining once a week in a perfect amount, but um, probably you'll have to water. So you wanna have a hose location or a spigot location that's not like 300 feet from your garden. So my house is right over there, just about 25 feet. So I can get away with, you know, a hundred foot hose, hose can kind of reach around my entire garden. And that makes watering all the more easy. You might notice that I have a fence around my entire garden and that's basically to keep out animals from nibbling on my vegetables. The major animal that we would worry about here in New Jersey would be white-tailed deer. Um, but I actually don't have deer in my yard because we have a full deer fence around the entire backyard. So this fence is kind of just for aesthetic, but what I've done is you can see there's the wooden um, horizontal boards here and underneath them, I put small wire mesh. So like a hardware cloth um, at about a half inch grade uh, square. Um, and I ran that all along the bottom, probably two feet of the garden fence. And that is to help keep out rabbits. So young rabbits can hop through the tiniest hole. So like a two by two square, they can just kind of sail right through. So this um, mesh is kind of buried into the ground a little bit to prevent them from sneaking underneath it. So it will help a little bit. It will keep out woodchucks, although woodchucks can burrow under here. Um, I've, I don't really have a woodchuck issue, so you, you might wanna dig down deeper with your fence if you have a woodchuck issue. Mice and voles and other small rodents, unfortunately, are nearly impossible to keep out of the garden because um, they can sneak into the tiniest, seemingly invisible holes. Um, so, you know, you're, you're gonna, run into some rodent issues it's just kind of the nature of things and you have to learn to live with them and not get too stressed about it okay let's talk about actual bed layout so we've talked about what kinds of crops you're going to grow so now you want to think about how much space you need so the entire garden um, is going to be a certain amount of space but really you, you can start by thinking about how big each individual bed is going to be so if you take a look over here i have raised beds so wide so wide meaning bigger than a foot. Wide raised beds are what I recommend to everybody. You do not need a wooden edge for it to be considered a raised bed. You can simply mound the soil up and call that your raised bed. I kind of like the wood um, just because it defines the edge really nicely. It helps me sort of mentally know where I have to weed. I weed in the bed, outside of the bed, I can, you know, I don't worry too much about it. Wide beds are gonna allow your roots to really spread out and kind of intermingle with one another. Um, there's going to be a lot less compaction because you have this wide space that you're growing in um, as opposed to skinny rows where you're walking alongside it so the roots can really spread out can spread down and you're going to get much better crop production in that sort of scenario so like i said i put the wood on here this is two by eight lumber um, just from the hardware store um, and it's not treated i recommend using untreated lumber for your garden beds um, they will rot and um, maybe every five or six years you might have to replace a board or an entire bed, um, but much better than using treated lumber and introducing some chemicals into your garden. So the size, there's three sizes that you're gonna consider for each garden bed. And keeping in mind, you do not have to use rectangles. You can use any sort of shape that you want. Um, you can use squares, um, triangles, you can even use circles, obviously without a wooden border, but you can set up circular beds. So be creative, get out some graph paper and um, design some garden beds. But the general size that you want to worry about are three things, how wide the bed is. And the width really has to do with being able to reach to the center. So I want to be able to kneel here and reach to the center of my bed and be able to weed from this side. And then I can go on the other side and reach other halfway in from the other side. Um, so that means I can touch the entire soil surface with my hands without having to step in the bed. You never want to step in your garden bed because um, that leads to compaction of the soil. So I recommend two feet um, being the, the minimum size 
um, and four feet being the maximum size for width of a bed. So two feet, if you can only reach from one side, for instance, if I had a bed pressed up against the, um, the fence over here, I might only make it two feet because I can't access it from the other side. These beds are about three feet um, and that's really comfortable for me. I'm kind of short, um, but I can reach to the center of all the beds. Um, if you are a little bit taller, you might want to go four feet. Okay, so that goes for a circle, triangle, whatever. You just want to be able to reach to the center. The length of the bed is sort of arbitrary. Um, if you're using wooden, um, you know, wooden edges, I recommend staying like 12 feet or under because the wood starts to warp and bow, even if you try to like attach, you know, metal attachments to make it really long. Plus you want to be able to walk around the garden beds. So you never want to step in it. So this is like a long 20 foot bed. Every time I want to get on the other side, I got to walk around and chances are you're going to want to step into it um, and you want to reduce that urge as much as you can. So these beds are just about eight feet long. Um, so they're about three by eight. That's the size that I set up and I have them kind of facing, orienting in different directions. And then I threw in a couple, like I have a square bed back in that corner because it was kind of an empty space. So I thought, let me tuck something in over in that corner. Um, and so you can do that. Um, the, the entire garden then will be how many beds do you need? So if you, um, you may have a small space, start there with one or two beds you can grow, or maybe you want to build your whole garden at once. Um, but don't start really big. You'll get overwhelmed. You want to kind of start small and grow from there. Length, width, and then you want to think about your path size. As you can see, I'm kneeling in my garden. I want to be able to, this is kind of how I decide my path width, really the length of my kneel. I want, this is how I garden. I garden, I'm always on my knees, um, which is why my pants always have holes in them. Um, you might wanna get a kneeler. <laughs> anyway, you wanna be able to kneel comfortably. I had some garden beds originally set up in this space where I had to almost be like sideways like this, reaching in. It was very uncomfortable uh, and I didn't like it. So I ended up taking down those and moving them a little bit apart. So before you actually, you know, build anything, think about how big the path should be. If you have some spaces where it's like a little bit more narrow, um, that's fine, but just make sure the bulk of the space where you're gonna be working is comfortable. If you're gonna be using a wheelbarrow or any other tool in your garden, make sure it can fit down many of those pathways. So if your wheelbarrow is three feet wide, your path is two feet wide, you're gonna constantly be annoyed by that. So you don't wanna, you wanna be comfortable in your garden. You wanna think about these things before you actually set them up. So we're gonna go back inside and think about how to get this plan from your head, sketch it out onto paper so that as soon as the spring comes, you can just get it set up in your backyard. So I'll meet you inside. Okay. Um, again, I popped in some um, slides just so that um, when, you, when you get this, you can remember some of what I was talking about. So soil and drainage, sun, wind, and access to watering. Here's the pictures of wide raised beds. Uh, and these are the dimensions that I talked about, two to four feet, length, 12 feet, and then the size of your path. And again, there's no strict rules for any of that. Um, plant spacing um, is what we're gonna just kind of quickly go over. And then I wanna take you to that online um, tool. But depending on what you're planting, they will require a different amount of space. So if you only have one garden bed, you can't fit like six tomato plants, six eggplants, um, a whole bunch of spinach, carrots, and radishes. It's just not enough space. So this is like an approximate spacing chart. Each of these squares is one square foot. So for instance, one tomato plant should take up about one square foot. So if you have multiple, you got to space them a foot apart. Lettuce, however, can be kind of crammed in a little bit closer. You can fit about four lettuce in a square foot. And something like a bush bean, you might be able to cram in um, even a little bit smaller. So you want to start to lay out your, you know, your garden beds and then sort of um, space it off by feet and then figure out what you can plant and how many. So you can go either way. You can either have your beds and then decide what you can fit in there, or you can decide what you definitely want to grow and then how many beds you need. This is a picture of just so garden planning. You have all these ideas about crops. You have um, a picture of what you either have in your yard or you're, maybe you're gonna expand or maybe you're gonna get bigger or maybe you just are gonna use the same beds but you wanna decide what is gonna go where. And this is a great time of year to do that. So you can see the picture on the left is just a graph paper. And I love using colored pencils and crayons and markers. And if you're an artsy type person, um, definitely go ahead and sketch out your stuff on graph paper. It's very rewarding. 
Um, this picture on the, oh, sorry, this picture on the right is taken from the online garden planning tool. And I wanna take you over to it just to give you a quick example of what it's like. So I'm gonna open that up. Um, you can see that, correct, on Grow Veg? Yes, I hope so. Yeah, yeah. Okay. we can see it. Awesome. Okay, I just want to make sure I'm sharing the correct page. Um, okay, so this um, website is called growveg.com. The name is right there up at the top. Um, they do have a free sample, like 30 day um, planner that you could try out and see if you like it. And then I, there is a charge for this, though. I, can, I think it's like $20 a year or something like that, maybe less. Um, it's definitely worth the money because you can do these plans and year to year go back and um, and use them and update them. So let me just show you real quickly how it works. Um, I've drawn in my garden bed. So there's tools up here um, and all down up and down the side so I can draw the size of the garden bed. So I drew some three by four garden beds in here. And then basically you just drag and drop crops and it automatically tells you what the spacing will be and how many you can fit in there. So we're gonna look over here we're gonna name, um, so I was looking at broccoli before, right? So I have one broccoli in here. If I wanna plant another one, um, you just drag in another one. If I wanna do something else, I can plant something else. I start typing lettuce. Let's see, I wanna choose a crisp head lettuce. Um, I click on it, drag and drop it in here. Um, and then you can see broccoli needs a lot of space. Lettuce needs a little bit of less space. Now there is a mode on here, which is right here in the corner where it says square foot gardening mode. Though some of you may have heard of this technique, that picture that I just showed you of spacing was taken from the square foot garden model. And that model basically crams plants in a little bit closer than the seed packet recommends, um, but you can play around with it. Sometimes I feel like the spacing is way too close and other times I think it's fine and it works. So use your judgment. But again, if we if we click on square foot gardening, we select crisp head, um, it's gonna tell you I can plant four plants in um, this square foot. So a lot closer together than just these, basically one per square foot over here. Um, you can also do, see if we want a carrot, square foot gardening um, would look like this, 16 carrots per foot. If I turn off square foot gardening, carrot would look like this. I'm just gonna pop it out here. And then what you can do is put one carrot and then you can drag it into a row. So say I have a row three feet long of carrots, um, then it's gonna tell me, um, does it tell me how many I need in there? It does somewhere. It, oh, in the plant list, it'll tell you how many carrots. So 16, um, tw I'm sorry, 25 carrots for four, by six, I think that was somewhere else that I planted that. But anyway, in your plant list, it'll tell you um, how many that is. And um, so you can go and play with it. You can add in, drag and drop different, um, different crops. You can put flowers in there. You can actually put like garden benches and hoses and all different pergolas. Um, and you can do a lot of really fun stuff. Um, so I encourage you, you know, it's dark and it's boring and go check it out just for fun. Okay, I'm gonna come out of my screen sharing. I'm gonna come back live. Kathy, if you wanna turn your video on, we have a few minutes remaining. If anybody needs to jump off of the, of the webinar, um, I'm gonna be answering some questions right now. Um, so hang around with us for a few minutes if you have it. Otherwise, thank you so much. What kinds of questions do we have, Kathy? We have a bunch. Um, <laughs> we probably won't be able to get through them all, but let's see um, how we do. Um, Here's one okay. question I liked. Um, what's the soil mix to get results similar to the bonnie plants that we see in um, Home Depot and big box stores? And I know that's not just gonna be soil related. <laughs> gotcha. There's a lot well, more there than soil. <laughs> I, could talk, I could give you my two hour soil lecture, but I feel like that would be too much for right now. Um, I do not use bagged soil is the, is the short answer to that. What I use is my ground soil. Now, it depends where you live. We, I live in Somerset County, New Jersey. We have high clay soil. That doesn't matter. High clay soil has a lot, of, a lot of minerals in it. You need to loosen it up with compost. So it'll take several years and eventually you'll get to a place where your soil is nice and fluffy. It is never going to feel as fluffy as potting soil, nor will it have the little white, <laughs> little white speckly perlite dots in there. Potting soil is for pots. 
Um, for your garden beds, I really do recommend using, digging into the ground, fluffing up what you have there so that it's not, no more compaction, mixing in some compost. Maybe your first year, you might wanna go bag, buy a bag of what they call topsoil, make sure it's organic, not potting soil, but topsoil, or you can get a bulk delivery of topsoil, um, but mixing in your compost and then year after year, all you're doing is adding compost to that. They say it takes about seven years to get to a soil that's like lovely and nice and fluffy. Um, so have patience, but, um, but use, use your soil, use the ground. <laughs> Uh, okay, another question. She didn't see sweet potatoes on either the seed or the transplant list. Oh, okay. <laughs> Which is interesting. Thank you. Uh, is see, sweet potatoes by transplant. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, add that in there. You would buy what's called a sweet potato slip. Um, and it basically is just like a little plant with some roots hanging off of it. And um, you put that right in the ground. Um, question about building raised beds and what was the best type of wood. Um, I answered some of that and said that we always used pine, even though cedar is an option, we always use pine. It's more accessible and more cost effective. But the question was, could you paint it and improve the longevity? And then what would the results be to the soil if you painted it? I don't know. I've, I've been asked that question before, and it just seems like something that I would never want to do. I'd rather just rebuild the bed in a few years. Yeah. Um, but you probably could. There's like some varieties of milk paint and paint is really like zero VOC these days. It doesn't, it doesn't have all that volatile stuff. I don't know if anything leaches into the soil off the top of my head. Um, I would think maybe it would be better if you're really concerned, maybe just line your wood with like a weed fabric. We've done that in the community garden um, where we actually staple, you know, weed fabric around, then fill it with soil. And at least then there's that little bit of a barrier. So uh, that might be the answer, but I, I really don't know about painting. Um, what do we need to know about the Japanese lantern fly? <laughs> That we hate That's a whole it. Another program. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't, it's not anticipated to affect in vegetable gardens very much. Fruit trees, maybe. Right. Um, them when you see them, they're very widespread. They really got grapevines, right? Grapevines. Yeah. yeah. But we so don't think it's going to affect vegetable gardening. We don't think, but we'll see. There was a lot in our community garden this year. So we'll see what happens next year. Fingers crossed. Um, Question, uh, this woman had a lot of shade in her backyard and could you recommend any vegetables that would do well in the shade? <laughs> shade is hard because plants really do want sunlight. So what I would say was you really need to avoid fruit bearing vegetables. So tomatoes, basil, eggplant, anything with a seed, I'll answer the long, long debate. Anything with a seed is a fruit, um, but you can get away with growing some of the greens. So lettuces, spinaches, kales, maybe even broccoli, cabbage, they require a little bit less sunshine um, and you can try that, but definitely not fruit stuff. You will not get a good fruit set. How do we decide if we should start seeds indoors or in winter sowing? Oh, I love that. So I'm teaching both classes. Um, <laughs> we're doing winter sowing. I think it's February, I don't know, it was on that opening screen, 13th, maybe 15th. Um, it's on the Duke Farms page. And then there's seed starting, we're doing March 1st, I think. Um, winter sowing is a little bit more flexible as far as your dates. So you can start stuff anytime pretty much. And then um, it'll just kind of stay in dormancy and start growing when it's ready. Whereas if you start stuff inside, you have to really pay attention to the calendar. So if you start tomatoes now, they're gonna be in the pot way too long. They're gonna grow leggy, they're gonna get yellow and you're not gonna have a good product to plant out in your garden. You have to pay a little bit more close attention to the timeline. Um, you could try anything in either method though. I've had better success with doing flowers and things like allium in winter sowing. Um, then I, I don't usually do like my brassicas, my kale, cabbage and the my tomato and pepper, I usually do those under the lights in my house. But you can play around with, but do a little bit of each, see which one works better for you. Um, do you have any suggestions on treating powdery mildew? 
No, but there is, oh God, I think it's, do you know, Kathy, is it called Milky Spore? Is it? Yeah, I've seen, I haven't tried it, but I've seen like recommendations with, you use milk and maybe a little Epsom salt and you spray. Um, I haven't tried it. Um, I don't know, we, we always, once we get the powdery mildew, the plants limp along for a while. Um, yeah. So usually powdery still mildew, get yeah powdery mildew is is going to affect a lot of the like zucchini and cucumber but they seem to not be too bad like you can trim off the dead yeah. leaves and then it'll flush out you know give them a little spritz of the fish emulsion and they'll keep going the pow the mildew i think it's downy mildew that affects basil that's really deadly um, and I don't think there really is not something that you can do about it, as far as I know. If you look up the words milky spore, I, mean, I can't remember what that does, but it's a, like a something you spray on. And that yeah. one, I'll have to look that up too. I haven't tried it. <coughs> okay, well, um, and here's, here's another good one. What do you suggest starting in a greenhouse and when do you suggest planting? That is the loaded question. So if you really want to know that, I encourage you to come to my vegetable seed starting class. So back in the in earlier in the slideshow, the, the plants that I said need to go by transplant, you need to start them inside. I don't have a greenhouse, but I start under grow lights in my basement um, a certain number of weeks before that frost date. So like tomatoes, it'll say start six weeks before the last frost date. And it'll say for like, cucumber start three weeks before the last frost date. Um, and then there are some seeds that you can plant directly into the ground based on the frost date. So lettuce can start going directly into the ground after April 15th, maybe even peas. a little before. Peas. Peas, yep. Um, <coughs> after the May 15th frost date, you can start direct sowing things like melons, zucchini, cucumber, um, and so you really have to just read the back of the seed packet to learn when to do what. There's a lot of online resources um, and certainly you're welcome to come to our class. Does any of this information change if you're growing in elevated raised beds? Say the beginning, I didn't hear it. So does any of the information that you just presented <laughs> change if you're growing in an elevated raised bed? No, so I grow all of the crops that I grow are in elevated, you know. Oh, do you mean like, yeah, like, like elevated, like off the ground? Like, yes, our accessible okay. Area. Um, okay, um, it, it will change because they, they'll dry out a lot faster. Yeah. The timing is not going to change, but the drying is going to be concerned. So, you really have to pay instead of, as I mentioned you know, watering once a week, maybe twice a week, you're going to basically be watering either every day, every other day. Definitely utilize some mulches um, to keep moisture in, but the drying is the ma major concern of those raised beds, unfortunately. It's really, really tricky. Um, also, if your beds, if you're filling a bed that's more than like 18 inches, once you start getting into the two feet, three feet, raised bed height, you know, some, some we have like some for wheelchair access that are like three feet tall, um, you want to amend your soil. So you are going to have to use purchased soil. And in this case, you can use like a potting soil with the perlite to keep it light. Um, and you can mix that with topsoil. Um, the perlite is going to help keep it light, make sure it doesn't compact. Because if you have like three feet of the soil in there, it's going to end up compacting on itself. So what, what's, uh, we use Pro Mix, P-R-O Mix, which is a really great potting soil. And we mix that with top, like bulk topsoil to fill our wheelchair accessible beds that are like two or three feet high. So you can give that a try. Um, I think we're gonna end there. I'm gonna copy this chat. I think, I think we can save this. Um, Kathy, maybe you could figure out how to do that. But um, we're gonna end there. I will look through the chat, see if there's any other questions um, that I can answer through email. Um, you'll get the PowerPoint presentation. Um, including the videos and um, any additional answers to questions that I have. And then you can certainly email me and follow up um, with further garden questions. Thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. I had a great time. I wish I could have seen you in person, but someday. And um, take care. We hope to see you back here.